So apparently New York had a huge thunderstorm yesterday, but it only happened once we boarded the plane. So they made us board, sit in the plane, then we saw the thunderstorms, and then they said, well, we're not going to take off for a little while. And then we sat for five hours on the tarmac. Um, and I asked if I could eat, because I hadn't eaten all day. And they go, when after takeoff, we'll give you food. So <laughs> that went on for a little while. Um, Super excited to be here. This is, um, I actually got into machine learning research very early in like high school, back when it wasn't super fashionable, but it was because I read a lot of UAI papers. So some of my favorite papers um, used to be published here, still published here, and a topic I'm gonna talk about today is all around safety. So about four-ish, five-ish years ago, I started becoming more and more obsessed with how machine learning could make an impact in domains like healthcare where we're starting to collect a ton of data, and this is really new. Like 10 years ago, this wasn't the case. And I see so many opportunities for, you know, like saving lives, improving outcomes, reducing cost. But in order to do that well, a lot of healthcare, healthcare historically has been a very rich field for methodological innovation from statistics, and in particular, causal inference, um, inference from observational data sets. And so it's been incredibly fun to blend ideas from traditionally the kinds of methods people have worked on in um, stats, biostats, and causal inference, and sort of way, the way uh, we perceive the world from machine learning, looking at high dimensional data and messy data sets. Um, and then out of that interest came basically um, three-ish three -ish years ago, three-ish, four-ish years ago, as I started developing ideas where it was really clear we could make a very big practical impact, I started interacting with practitioners like, you know, health system, like um, system builders and like doctors and nurses to be able to starting to think about how do we deploy. And the more we started building on systems to deploy, now in advertising, you know, if you get things wrong, it doesn't cost you that much, but in healthcare, you know, I used to be challenged by thousands of like physicians who ask extremely thoughtful questions. Um, and at, by virtue of being at a place like Johns Hopkins, where there are some of, you know, the physician leaders in the world in each of these specialty areas, they look at cases and they look at what the machine learning system would say. And it was on the one hand, you know, people um, like really exciting. On the other hand, it was really scary because I felt like we really hadn't, as a field, developed credibility in building systems that are reliable and robust and actually can um, be implemented within practice in domains which are safety critical. And so that sort of led to a lot of my work in this space in the last few years. And uh, today I'll give you an overview of some of the most recent work here um, in trying to think about how do we monitor and make these kinds of systems safety proof. So everybody's possibly seen this example before of adversarial um, blindness. I just um, as a starting point, like an example on the left, we see a photo of a, a panda, and then computer sort of correctly gets it right, and then you add a little bit of jitter and noise, and then to the right, you see an image which a human would still see as a panda, but a computer very confidently gets it wrong and calls it a gibbon. And so you know, examples like this are extremely scary to people, practitioners, where if they are going to rely on a system like this to make pretty critical decisions, they want to understand what the failure modes are. And that was only one such example. Now, in the last year and a half, there are numerous such examples. The second example here, I was the guest editor for PLOS, where we asked for papers at the intersection of machine learning and healthcare, and this paper was a very well-touted result, um, I think that originally came out of Stanford on like um, using um, lung x-rays and chest uh, CT scans to be able to diagnose disease, so in this case, pneumonia. And what this paper found was that the system worked really well when they implemented it on like some offline data set from the first uh, two hospitals and then the second they put it in the third hospital it performed really poorly so they took it in one hospital it worked really well they applied to the second it performed decently and then they applied it to a third one it performed really terribly and turns out the problem was that the system was learning like 
you know, stylistic preferences and the image, which happened to, you know, leak information about the first two hospitals were very similar, so the information that was leaking through the style aspects of the image was actually very productive. But in the third case, that was actually hurting them. Here's a third example. This is of a system we deployed, um, or we were you know, in early stages of developing and deploying, and this is where we are trying to look at high dimensional streams from uh, clinical streams of labs and vitals. Um, and we were using it to identify this um, you know, deadly uh, adverse event called uh, sepsis. So it's like a disease that's life-threatening, and if you can identify it early, you can treat those patients and potentially save them. And what we've shown is that you can actually integrate a lot of electronic health record data, like routine labs and uh, vitals that they collect, in order to be able to identify these patients early. And that was a really exciting result. That was like a very exciting first off machine learning result applied to this kind of pretty exciting serious problem back in 2014, 2013. But then what was interesting was that since we developed this system, um, or since we sort of did the early work, CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid, is like a policy body in the US. They changed the rules. And they started um, you know, seeing um, more and more data that like sepsis can be prevented if treated early. So they came up with a new policy. And this new policy required every hospital to start reporting um, sepsis outcomes and implementing some really, really simple measure for making sure that they were monitoring sepsis. What did that mean? That means there was changes in practice in how physicians were now collecting labs. And in particular, the example I've highlighted here is this very critical lab called lactates, which they used to previously only collect when they suspected sepsis. But now, because of the score measure, they started collecting it all over the place. And because they started collecting it all over the place, suddenly there was, had been a shift in the distribution. And that led to a system that was doing really, really well. Suddenly, the false alerting rates shot up like crazy. So again, another example. Uh, this, again, has been talked about a lot, a system that does really well with certain populations and not so well in other populations. Um, and then another example, this is predictive policing, where um, this was in um, this police departments around the country. What they did was in um, New Jersey and LA were two counties that did this, where basically they took a, a machine learning driven system called PredPol. And what the system did was look at historical data to forecast where the crime is going to be. And then, based upon the forecast, they would send cops there to measure crime rates. And then effectively, the more they were measuring a particular neighborhood, the more data they were collecting. The more data they were collecting, the more data they had to learn from. And there was this very nice feedback loop, which was very detrimental. So effectively, again, unknown to, unbeknownst to them, right? So sort of net-net, where is this going? Basically, um, I think you know, from the outside, if you're only read, like there's so much euphoria for machine learning and um, excitement and people are starting because of TensorFlow and the tools that are available that's easy to download, people are really excited to start downloading these tools and applying them in all sorts of really interesting and important applications. Um, that, and, and they feel like this is sort of the answer to the future. The challenge is like as someone who, you know, people who work in the field, the thing that freaks me out is basically like, you know, we know that most things are far more complicated than it looks, and um, it's not about the uber complicated model that you just deploy, and then voila, with the AUC, the challenge is very often there are all sorts of ways in which, uh, in practical scenarios, um, your system can misbehave. And so I think a lot of it is to do with this kind of shift where, you know, we declared victory by, like, writing a research paper for UAI on Europe or whatever. And these research papers were very much, here's my fixed data set. I'm just going to measure, beat my the soda, and I'm going to declare victory. And uh, the big shift going from sort of a fixed data set to this sort of deployment environment is that, first of all, your predictions are only a piece of it. But also, there's just so many things changing in the environment, changing in the data. And that requires far more thoughtfulness in thinking through, um, th thinking through whether the system is uh, you know, robust and reliable and ready for prime time. 
And this is especially important to us as a field. Like for me, I was under crazy scrutiny uh, you know, as I was interacting with people on the health side, but I think there are equal number of researchers now getting excited about education, transportation, and you know, obviously for us to not have a like another winter, I guess we should be responsible. So I, I, I don't have to preach to the squire. People here are far more responsible than some of the other meetings. Um, so, so this remains still one of my favorites, even though it's. Um, so I think some of you should go to the other meetings and you know evangelize. Um, so, so I think um, here what I like basically. Um, one fresh source of frustration is that people just talk about bias. Bias has become the sweeping underbelly of AI, I think. Like whenever, like, you know, in a lot of, when, especially when people outside the field are talking about AI, the two things they talk about is one, what can AI do? All the amazing things AI can do. And then two, what about bias in AI? And it's become this like ridiculous word where it means anything and everything. And so part of the reason here was I wanted to just kind of break out, like, there's sort of research in like things like fairness, which is you know how can we make sure the ML system is behaving in a fair way, it doesn't discriminate, or the ethics of AI, which is you know understanding like depending upon a community, their ethics will change, and your system, in order for it to behave ethically, you need to understand what is the ethics of the community within which you're hoping to operate, and I think those topics are very hairy, very very important yet extremely different from what I think of as like the engineering discipline of reliability. So what do I mean by that? So, you know, we used to, as engineers, when we build things, we have an expectation that when we say we've built this and this should do this, it actually does that, right? I mean, I know at some point we were like, oh, we're not engineers, we're like scientists, we're super cool, that's engineering, that's for those engineer people, but I personally think like when, you know, thinking that way has, is what's kind of taking us down this like very slippery slope where we build things and we have no idea what it does. So sort of just bringing back this engineering principle of like reliable, engineering principle of it does what we expect it to do and we understand what it should be doing, right? So that seems pretty fundamental like 101, which it's amusing that we're sort of, we're really good at doing really fancy things, but we're bringing back the basics. So, so reliability is kind of how I think of is that, is the ML system behaving the way we expect it to behave? And robustness sort of from a statistical standpoint has, is sort of a term for just understanding, you know, it's, it's a statistical concept. And, I, and the reason um, I'm adding this notion of reliability is because I think, um, as um, um, methodologists and um, people who are statistically, mathematically leaning, we love crisp, clean ideas. And the challenge, as I will describe through the rest of the talk, is in many scenarios, you need kind of mixed methods. You need to understand what the failure modes are, and in order to understand failure modes, you need to know your domain. You need to know where the failure can come from, and then build and tailor perhaps not even one thing, a collection of things to make sure that the end goal and system is reliable and you, you're sort of increasing your reliability characteristics as they would call it in other engineering disciplines. And so this concept is not new in almost all the engineering disciplines that are safety critical. They have whole you know, uh, principles in place in order to ensure reliability and um, in order to, and so I'm not gonna go through all, a lot of this. This, you know, we cover some of the uh, principles that people have explored in other areas and bring them back into machine learning to think hard about where the gaps are and then where do we stand with respect to these principles and where are the open problem areas. So if you're curious, take a look. I'm just only going to cover a tiny, tiny bit of it. So today's, Example. So I started my talk with a collection of examples, and um, most of those examples are not all like in the press. People just talk about it as AI bias, and I think it's very important for us to solve problems and for us to be productive. We need to take these examples and start breaking it up into a taxonomy, a taxonomy where we say these problems are occurring, and the problem this is of a type where basically this was a bad idea. This was a stupid problem to solve. You didn't have the data to do it.
right? And turns out, like, we have examples of those problems all over the place versus examples where you had inadequate data. So you could have solved it, but you just didn't have enough representative data to be able to make the claims you wanted to make or that you wanted, you should be making weaker claims given the data you have. So that's the second type of error. A third type, which is the kind I'm gonna talk about today, most of it, is this notion of shifts. So shifts means changes in the environment, changes in the data distribution. And many of these times, these are actually quite subtle. So something we currently often miss. And the thing that we've been thinking about is how do we start building systems like either learning methods or monitoring in order to be able to protect ourselves from these shifts. So this was one example I gave you here. They went from one hospital to another. Turns out there was a shift in the population and also shift in the styles of x-ray. Now, you really should be not susceptible to shift in the styles. And, and in this case, that was leading to an error. So uh, we'll talk through like how do you build systems that are robust to these shifts. Again, in this case, there were shifts in the way people were measuring things over time. And so it shouldn't have really impacted uh, performance, but it did because the methods we, you know, the traditional methods we use were not invariant to practice policy. And as a result, um, it learned uh, systems that were, you know, performance varied as practice patterns changed. This is another example that I previously brought up here that was shifts over time in the data distribution, right? You're collecting the, you know, the feedback loop is leading to a shift in the data distribution. And ideally, what you really should be inferring is the true crime rates, not just regurgitating what's in the data and sort of just kind of summarizing associations of observed crime rates by neighborhood. So another example of a scenario where um, if we were to learn something that were to be invariant, we can fix this issue. So final, I'll do this one example and use this as a running example. So this example got a lot of attention. It was a paper um, Rich wrote back in 2015 and um, has been cited crazily and people think of it as like why machine learning is gonna kill people in medicine. So. Here's a model where he trained the model to predict mortality due to pneumonia. So these are patients with pneumonia, and he's taking data on the left. So on the left, you have vital signs, lab tests, and then all the comorbidities they have. So like somebody has asthma, pneumonia, et cetera, right? So that's on the left, and this is UAI, so you're not afraid of graphs. I can you know, show my graphs and no problem. So here in this case, this is the target, these are the inputs. And then this is sort of the graph that shows how they relate. And so he took a model and he trained basically risk of mortality when patient shows up in the emergency department, the first time they're showing up, they're measuring all these labs, they're measuring these vitals, they're measuring what comor like, you know, what other diseases, symptoms they have. And using all of that, they're trying to forecast, is this patient at risk of dying? Okay. And the, his thought was, we're going to use this model to be able to decide whether I should send this person to the intensive care unit where the sickest patients go, or I should send this patient to the floor where the not as sick patients go. Okay? So his goal was to do triage. So he said, great, I'm going to train this model and I'll do it. And when he trained this model, he looked at his um, data, the, the performance was wonderful. Like it was very, very high. But when he looked and started digging in, what he found was that the patients in his population who had both pneumonia and asthma, so asthma is, hopefully some people know what asthma is, but basically someone with pneumonia who also has asthma is way worse off than someone who only has pneumonia. So in this case, basically what the model learned in his case is that if a patient has both pneumonia and asthma, they're actually less likely to die than somebody who only has pneumonia. So that's pretty counterintuitive, right? So if they only have pneumonia, they're less likely to die. And so the question is like, why did it learn that? Well, it turns out if you dig in the data, people who have pneumonia and asthma, they tended to be sent to the ICU because they were sicker. And because they were going to the ICU, they were getting far more intensive, far more careful amounts of vigilance. And so these patients were being rescued on the other hand, pneumonia actually can be very deadly if you don't attend to it in time. And so the patients who were going into the floor, what was happening was people would miss them and they sent, you know, more of them were getting missed and as a result, maybe their outcome was worse in this hospital. So 
What happened here? Let's go back to this point of shifts, right? So he had hoped to use it. He had hoped that the data looks something like the graph to the left, which is I can use my things on the left and predict the right. But what happened is, in reality, in his training environment, there was one policy that was driving who goes to the ICU. That's the arrow on the left, right, the red arrow. And in the test environment, he wanted to drive it using a different policy, which is his algorithm. So I've pointed out the shift in the distribution using a colored edge that's a red edge. So even though all the other edges are black, the red edge is what varies between training and testing. And now if you have a red edge that's varying between training and testing, using very simple deseparation, you can see that if I train a predictor on the left graph, I have an unstable path that goes from asthma to ICU to mortality, right? And it's learning the distribution on that unstable path in my training model. So now when I go to my test set and use that model, it is no longer applicable, right? Because it's memorized something from the data that doesn't hold in the test environment. Can I, I'll actually take a question if people are confused. If this makes total sense, please nod. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so this basically means, so really simple, right? So very simple and easy way to explain that it wasn't just the fact that you have to look at your inputs and diagnose. Of course, diagnosis is gonna teach you all the things you're going wrong and you absolutely have to do that. But also that there was this very, like it was implicitly learning this unstable um, like influence path that it shouldn't have learned. Um, so data shift errors are suddenly occur easily as we go from train to deploy, can we learn? And so, so basically the point here is can we learn models that are invariant, these kinds of shifts, right? And, and, and shifts her generalization, why? Because sample data violates the IID assumption or data and tests are similar to train. And then um, all of the, um, and, and what we want to be able to do is basically to learn word stable, quote, stable models. And stable means models that are invariant to these shifts, okay? And so typically when people have tried to, so data set shift, people have worked on it for a long time. Actually, there's been sort of a, over a decade of work now, probably more than a decade, but at least a decade of robust work on it. And um, many of the early ideas that people had explored are all around transfer learning. So the idea that like you're in it, thinking of it as domain adaptation. So you're in domain A, now you have data from domain B. Once you have data from domain B, how do you take minimal data from domain B to learn a sample efficient um, estimator that generalizes? And so in that scenario, what you're really doing is basically some version of reweighting, right? So transfer learning, some version of reweighting, and you're waiting for data from your test domain to be able to tune what you learned in your training domain and to have it generalized. The challenge is, if you think of it from a reliability standpoint where you want to build a system and give guarantees, and you know, once you deploy, all sorts of changes could happen. So you can't do this version of let me try to wait for all sorts of new data to come and tune. What you really want is to be able to characterize up front what are changes you must absolutely be invariant to and learn such that you can guarantee that kind of invariance. So with that, like kind of switching to sort of this more proactive rather than a reactive mode of learning where, you know, in a failure prevention paradigm, you want to learn model to protect from rightly problematic shifts. Okay, so in summary, we need a framework for representing different types of shifts. Up on a lot of papers, early papers, have sort of given very one, one um, algorithms that tackle like a very, you know, special case of in this scenario, if this happened, then I would do this reweighting to do that. So you know, you have many different kinds of ships and complex domains, how do we handle that? We need a way to learn models that are guaranteed to be invariant to these pre-specified shifts. And um, unlike in the, um, like a simple problem that many people say is, oh, if you deploy simple models, it's easier to diagnose with them, like where the bug might be, and therefore you are more easy to, it's more easy for it to be safe, right? But in machine learning, we don't like to do that. We want to have all the expressiveness possible. So it's really important that the language not force us to be, to be, um, to stick to very simple models. So first thing we're gonna do is think of graphs, because we love graphs. Graphs is a language for representing different kinds of shifts, and these can represent um, um, almost any of the kinds of shift, or any shift people have previously discussed can be represented using graphs. So I'm gonna give you a very, very simple example here. So I have a four node 
domain. Now you could forget the graph and think of it as a spreadsheet with data. There are four columns in this. And your goal is to be able to predict T, which is one variable, classic classification or prediction problem. You have a regression problem, you have T, and you have some input variables, which are C, Y, and D. And, and I drew the graph because I'm drawing the data generating process, right? So here, this is the data generating process that tells you how these variables relate. And now the imp and with green and reds, what I've done is green are all the edges that are stable. That means across train and test, these edges hold. And red is something that varies over time. And so here, what it's doing is basically, um, if I do something naive, so if I do something naive like T, let's say D is uh, a hidden variable, it's missing. And if I want to predict T given the observed variable, just C and Y, now T given C and Y will give you a model here that's unstable. Um, so do you see why? So because T given C and Y, like, let's look at all the input variables, let's draw all the um, paths from the input variables into the output variable, and if any of those paths contain a red edge, that means it's memorizing an unstable piece, right? That doesn't generalize. So in this case, T given C, Y means there's an active path from C to D to T, which contains the red edge. And unless you block that path, you're going to learn something that is unstable. So T given C, Y is unstable. T given D, C, Y is stable, right? So in this example, very simple example, you have a way of looking at a graph and doing several things. One, by drawing the data generating process and identifying which edges are changing. You can then ask something about the global distribution, which is given a target in mind, T given C, Y in this case. Can you ask if this model is going to be stable or unstable? And the way you do that is by drawing, um, looking at all the active paths between the target and the inputs. And if any of the active paths contain um, an unstable edge, then that's basically an unstable model. And if you can get rid of all the unstable edges, then you'll basically get a stable model. So intuitively, this is a starting point. I'll actually pause questions. OK, so if this makes sense, then um, so using a graphical mo modeling formalism for expressing shifts in data, intuitive to reason with, and provides a simple way to visualize different types of shifts. Um, and then protecting from shifts requires trading off um, performance, which is accuracy and invariance, right? So, so in simply, you could learn everything, which means you take your data and you learn everything. And if you learn everything, you will include lots of spurious dependencies that don't generalize, so you get no invariance. On the other hand, you could learn very conservatively, which means you only learn parts of the graph that effectively are stable. Or in, and the benefit of that is you're going to get a stable model the bad part of that is basically you're going to ignore potentially, it'll be, so the question is, you know, if you just keep a small part of the graph, you may ignore other parts of the graph that are stable, right? So I, optimal is where you can learn as much as possible without compromising any of the desired invariances, right? So you want it to be stable and you want to capture as many of the black edges as possible. Wonderful, so that was all of the setup. So here's the first result. So. Um, um, and more details on that paper, but basically uh, what we describe here is you know, a, C, um, a hierarchy of stable distribution. So what do we mean by hierarchy of stable distribution? So if you were to give, be given a data, data set and um, each one of these are classes of methods which give you an estimator. And you can go look at the estimator they give you and analyze the property of that estimator. And so the first type are conditional distributions and I'll go into more detail into what these are. Second type are interventional distributions, and the third type are called counterfactual distributions. And it turns out, basically, from top to bottom, the, the top are the easiest to estimate. That means using your data, you can very quickly, um, you can often, very often estimate these. And on the other hand, they miss a lot of the stable relationships. So they're easy to estimate, but they're not optimal. They basically leave a lot of the stable parts of the graph at the table. If you go all the way to the bottom, the counterfactual distributions are the tightest. They try to leave as little on the table as possible. That means they capture as many of the black edges as possible. But on the other hand, they are difficult to estimate in the sense that they rely on more assumptions being true in the data. And you have to work harder to estimate these. And I'll, dry, and I'll give intuition to what these different, um, to this, what the second and third are. Let's start with the first one because you've 
um, probably seen these. So graph pruning is the simplest way people have tackled this, where they basically say, I want an input target in variable y, and I have a whole bunch of inputs. And in order to build a stable model that is invariant or robust or invariant to certain changes in the distribution, what they're going to do is to explore the set of input variables and choose which ones to drop, right? So effectively, it's like saying, let me take this graph, I've had a big graph, subselecting from that input variable a much smaller set such that y given that smaller input set is stable, right? Now, the good news of that is you're going to get a stable model. The bad news is, for instance, in this example, t, if d was unobserved, your stable using graph pruning, you would basically get your input variable set to be an empty set because there's nothing you can do by just dropping variables. And you basically have to do you know, more than that, like block and tackle by blocking paths in order to be able to get to something more than an empty set. So far, so good? Head nod? OK. I'll take questions along the way of this. So basically, graph pruning is the most straightforward, the most common thing people use. Yes? Yeah, exactly. So, so the question was that if we make no assumptions on you know, how much the red edge can vary, then the right thing to you would get an empty set. On the other hand, if you can make some assumptions about how much the red edge can vary, then you may be able to do better. Um, and that's exactly right. So, so what we're going to attempt here is to start with the purest version, which is let's assume you have any ability, because when policy in practice, when policy changes occur, it's very hard in practice to say how much it will change very often. So what you really want is total invariance to many, many edges. And so you want a way to be able to guarantee total invariance. And then towards the end, I'll comment on the fact that once you can know how to get total invariance and then there are edges you're not so sure, you can play the stability optimality trade-off, which that this paper at the bottom talks about, by basically using uh, regularization for the edges where you want to put a soft uh, penalty on it. Um, so the question David asked is, um, do we know at inference time um, what shifts are going to occur in the test distribution? So the setup here is going to be as follows. You're going to write out your data generating process. You may not be 100% sure of what your data generating process is, so there will be uncertainty in your data generating process, but that's okay. You can write that out too. And then what we're going to do is to say, given the data generating process and my uncertainty in the data generating process, I want to be a responsible engineer, like just like we would do in nuclear engineering or any other field, which means I'm going to say, what are the ones where it would really hurt me if I screwed up? And those are the ones you're going to use to identify as a one for which you need total invariance. And you're going to add, add, create a spec, right, so that for safety, many safety domains, uh, one of the things, uh, you know, a recurring theme there is like the notion of an upfront spec where you have an understanding of what your failure modes are and trying to create a spec that gives you failure proofing against the, that spec. So in this case, this would mean what are the edges you absolute want total invariance and then what is the one where you're willing to do a trade-off? You don't know. And then effectively, you're going to run this, um, the next set of things that I'm going to talk about, you're going to play through this whole thing, get an output, see what the performance looks like, see what the stability looks like, and then choose among the, those solutions. Yeah? Can you try to explain and go back to your x-ray example? Yeah, I'll actually come back to the x-ray example. I have three slides dedicated exactly to that. No, no, one slide. OK. No, the thing. This one? Which one? Oh, I see, not x-ray slide. You mean the hierarchy, stable hierarchy. Got it, got it, got it. Where is it? This one? Oh, I see, this one? 
Yeah, I, that's exactly what I said. I have three slides dedicated in the end to just tie all of this to the x-ray example, which I will promise I will get to. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm gonna move. Um, okay, so what I'm going to next talk about is this notion of, so graph pruning was at a high level we described straightforward. We're gonna talk a little bit about the interventional distribution today. So, um, so you know, there are four kind of key steps to it, right? So the first thing is this notion of representing shifts using graphs. So, and the ability to identify spec to which, uh, to identify which shifts to protect from. So let's do very simple quick, like let's say you had an example where you had smoking habits now and you wanted to forecast whether or not you're gonna get cancer in say two years. And so effectively the graph is really simple, it's two variables, you're predicting cancer in two years using smoking habits today. And then let's imagine there was a smoking ban, right? So in other words, people were asked to not smoke anymore. So now what you get is two years later, you're reapplying this model and you get S at two, two years from now, predicting cancer two years further out, which is C at four. And what you basically have is this is an example of what's classically called covariate shift. So covariate shift means the inputs have shifted, and this example in this formalism would be X and T, T given X, and X is changing, so basically the unstable red arrow goes into the distribution of X is changing, but T given X is stable. And here what we do is we use like a causal selection diagram, this is in our invention, this is um, classical instrument that's used and basically a causal selection diagram to be able to um, identify, you know, if we're using a variable S, selection variable that points into the um, variable against which we want to guarantee invariance. So in this case, uh, the distribution is X is changing and we want to protect from having, um, you know, it should be robust and stable to the distribution of X changing. So that's covariate shift. Uh, another common thing people talk about is label shift, where it's not the inputs that are changing, it's the outputs that are changing, and you can use the same exact way to express uh, label shift. I'm gonna apply the same idea to the example from Caruana, where basically we had the graph on the left, I just replicated it, and I want invariance to the policy of whether somebody is gonna go into the ICU or not. So I'm putting basically a, a red ar a selection variable pointing into that random variable, right? So this is my graph spec, so I drew the graph, now I've drawn a spec of what do I want invariance with respect to. So far, so good. And very often when people see graphs, these days people are very skeptical because they'll say, oh, graphs, there's no way this thing generalizes. And so in this example, we have a much bigger example and essentially this is a, a example we work with quite a bit in the lab where we're looking at um, um, invariance to policies for prescribing lab tests. And so these are effectively common lab tests that are done in a lab, and this is the uh, data, the graph we use for predicting sepsis. Um, and so David might ask, like, oh my God, there's no way you know this graph to be true. And, and that's the beauty of it. The point is there's no escaping. If you want some kind of failure proofing, you kind of have to understand what is your data generating distribution, where the invariances are going to be. Now the answer may not be as simple as I drew the graph in five minutes, end of story. It may take some time and it may require you to write out all of your uncertainty, like where are all the places you're unsure to protect from, but effectively uh, that's kind of, you know, but that can be done, it's just more time. Okay, so the first thing you do is um, kind of write the spec. Now the second thing you do is basically um, essentially so I won't go into the depths of this estimator, but what the estimator does is now looks at the graph and it's basically intervening on all the variables where you've put a, um, a selection variable pointing in. And what it's doing is identifying the output of this is essentially um, telling you what are the factors you want to learn from the data. So in this case, let's say I had a graph of this form on the left what it's identifying for you is what are the factors you want to learn from the data and how should these factors be combined in order to be able to produce something that is stable, okay? So essentially think of it as like a preprocessor or a wrapper. Given a graph, all it's done is analyzed basically the invariance spec and what you want invariance with respect to and then it's using that to identify what are the portions of the graph you want to be learning in terms of these factors and it's going to give you full freedom to understand how exactly those factors should be learned, but effectively these are the factors you should learn and this is how you should combine it in order to produce a model that is unstable. Okay, so I'm gonna 
actually go a little bit further to kind of talk through what do I mean by in order to get something stable. Um, so I talked about these factors, how it should be combined, and here in this case, um, sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, the it doesn't include every factor in your original graph. So, so in this particular, so, so your question is, is is every factor included? Not every factor. The output of the surgery estimator is not necessarily, um, um, like, not every factor that was in your original graph is included. Does that make sense? And so now that you know what factors to fit, you can fit them using your favorite method, including whichever um, rich function approximator you'd like, including, um, let's say, if you had temporal data that was really sparse and had um, you wanted to be able to fit a rich time series model, you can use an RNN, or you can use um, you, you, you know, a, a method of your choice. So the thing that's exciting about this is basically the fact that um, you can basically, there are parts of the model that are black box. Where, but from an invariance and stability standpoint, you don't have to worry about it. It's basically like a preprocessor that tells you off the total graph, what are the parts you need to fit? And then as long as, and you can now fit those parts as you'd like, and the output is still the case that you would get invariance, right? Without having to worry about what's within each section. I'll do this last part and then I'll take questions. So. So now you can prove two things about it. So first is uh, the procedure sound. That means the return distribution is invariant to anticipated shifts. Um, and then the second is that it's complete, which means if it fails, then no estimable invariant distribution exists in the class of conditional or interventional distributions. So in other words, there, and, and so in that example that I had here, um, right, so okay, so sound and complete, I'll show you an example in a second. And so effectively you might say, well, what do I do if for instance, I'm getting something that is, um, what do I do if I'm getting something where it tells me there isn't an invariant distribution, there isn't a stable model here that can be fit? Well, so the estimator kind of relies on actually um, uh, Spritz and Pearl's uh, ID algorithm to be able to identify what is possible to like, one, what are the variables that are unobserved? And then um, as a result, what is the confounding that you get as a result of it? And third, then what can be estimated from the data? And so in order to be able to um, kind of, um, you know, if it returns an, an empty set as an answer, you can go back and see if there are new data variables you can collect that were previously hidden or previously, un, or previously confounded and now basically, cre um, you know, open up, I guess, ways in which you can capture invariance. So far, so good. So two things you can do, relax your invariance spec. In other words, you had desired you want it against A, B, C, D. You can desire less invariance. And second thing you can do is to find ways to lift some of the assumptions you'd made by going and measuring more variables in practice. And then finally, um, and, and then finally, so sound and complete and also distributionally robust. So it gives, it optimizes for the lowest worst case loss across, so across all distributions where you want total invariance. In other words, an adversary can come in and vary the um, edges, the red edges or the variables on which we have the selection um, variable in. It basically optimizes to get the best uh, predictor or best estimator uh, given worst case on the adversary. So it's, um, okay, so that's basically ends this section. I'll take questions. Actually, one last one, and then I'll take questions. So this is the, um, so it's distributionally robust. And then final uh, piece here that's uh, interesting is the fact that I started with the panda example, and there's been a lot of work on um, adversarial robustness. And basically, when in adversarial robustness, for those of you who don't work on it, the idea is that when you look at your data uh, distribution, the input distribution, there are parts of the surface where effectively there are holes and like around the example where small perturbations will give you really uh, wildly varying answers, right? So these are called blind spots, if you will. And so that is more a property of the um, model 
you're fitting and the learning algorithm you're using to fit it. So in this case, the way the two complement is basically the surgery estimator that I told spoke about gives you invariance to the um, gives you invariance to the kinds of shifts you're anticipating. And so now you have an estimator, but in order to fit it to data, you're still using, you know, rich, flexible methods to fit it to data. And it's possible that in fitting any given factor, you may want to use an adversarially robust method in order to be fitted so that you can avoid blind spots, right? So the two are very complementary is the point here. And you want to do, do A and B to, so I have, um, how much time do I have left? Like, do I have like 10 minutes? Like, can I take 10 minutes to keep going? Okay, so why don't I like pause? I'll take questions all the way to the end now because I have like, I'm looking at my slide count and getting a little worried. Um, but then I'll hang around so you can still ask me questions afterwards. Um, so the example, the chest ray example that somebody had asked about, in this case, um, you wanted, we wanted to be able to diagnose pneumonia, which is T, from F and X. That was the example, right? So we, we were given this chest X-ray, uh, lung X-ray, and we wanted to be able to see whether the patient had pneumonia or not. And um, X is the X-ray and pneumonia, and you might imagine you just put the lung X-ray in and you do T given X, right? But then you'd have, this was the unstable edge, so you'd have an unstable path here that would be active. So in order to make the unstable path go away, what you need is some way to deactivate this edge. And so the way to do that is basically in this case, you essentially are going to treat this as the invariant spec, which basically says, I want to, um, so this is, I want, this was my um, unstable edge. Here's my invariant spec saying I want invariance to changes in this distribution. And now when you forward propagate that, uh, run the estimator through this, you basically get the following, which is um, for each, each of these images, first estimate F. So F are these style features. And the style feature here is the specific way in which the, um, it's, um, the features here are basically like, is it the front image or the back image? So the thing that's monogrammed on the top right, you're instead of just gonna give the image as is, you're going to actually explicitly extract that information from the image, and that's what these features are. So first, estimate f for each image, then fit p of x given t, f, and p of t. So those are the two factors the surgery estimator wants you to estimate. And now you uh, integrate the two to obtain, basically, the predictor you cared about. And this predictor will be stable, as opposed to the other predictor, which we previously had. OK, so I spoke a lot about the interventional distribution. In a nutshell, um, here's the graph. And if I had basically in this graph v, y, w, x, and z, and the edge from y to x was varying, what, um, what basically um, the, the uh, surgery estimator was doing was intervening on these variables, the, the variables where we put the selection um, variable in. So in this case, um, it would do do of x, it drops these two edges coming in, and you're basically getting the following outcome, which is y given y given v, z, and do of x is stable. And this w here is hidden, so you're not conditioning on it. Uh, on the other hand, if you had done y given v, z, and original x, that would be unstable. And then y given v would be stable, but it would not be, that would be your graph pruning estimator but graph pruning, you'd be dropping a lot of info at the table, right? So, so far, so good. So quick summary, in this simple example, you would be dropping a bunch. This gives you something that is stable, uh, and the original thing that you would have naively done would be unstable. Okay, so in order to motivate the next one really quickly in this example, one thing you might notice is that in order to actually build this interventional distribution, what did we do? We got rid of both the y to x edge and the w to x edge. Right? Like we got rid of two sources of information, the y to x edge and the w to x edge. But that means we left information at the table that we shouldn't have, right? So is there a way for us to only drop the y to x edge and not the rest? And so that's sort of what motivates this third thing, which is called this counterfactual distribution. And here, um, at a high level, the idea is basically we're going to introduce new counter variables that are, we call counterfactual variables. And what the variables do is effectively they're looking to block these red paths. 
Okay. So in this example, effectively, in order to introduce a counterfactual variable here, like we want x to become independent of y. So and but we don't want to delete all edges into x. So we're basically going to put as parent of x y, which is we're fixing a variable y. Um, x here now is a counterfactual variable which says what would be the value of x had y been fixed to be some constant, in this case 0 and w. And then you're basically um, separating, and then the rest of it, so this is z under the observed data distribution, the x that's in the data. I'm going through this really fast. There is no way I can explain this whole thing in the next six minutes. So this is all to intuitively only give you this idea that basically, I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on right here. So, but it's only to give you this idea of, I have the ability, like you want to be able to understand up front where do you want your invariances to be. You want to be able to express those invariances, then you have ability to use tools of increasing precision and in trying to be able to get estimators that are stable uh, or invariant to the specification that you've given. And, and this is sort of in that example showing um, the the counterfactual distribution, if it can be estimated, actually would give you uh, a richer estimator than, say, the um, interventional distribution. OK, so I spoke at great deals of length about this idea of like failure proofing, where you basically, prior to deployment, upfront think very hard about your risks, specify your risks, and then learn against those risks a model that you know a model that allows you to forget parts of the distribution you shouldn't be learning, and um, keep the parts that you should. And so, just um, going forward here, um, I'm going to do only in like a very few super quick slides, just sort of a few other ideas. So here in this case, forget you've done learning, you've done all you could, and now you're at test time. You're deploying, and so this notion of ensuring reliability. We are test time monitoring. So now you're not, it's not just about the learning method. It's like during test time, can we put ways to monitor prediction at any given time? And people have spoken historically a lot about anomaly detection or open category detection. But much more generally, this idea of like um, kind of what are ways in which we can take advantage? Like right now, you know, if we predict, we predict. And then we have, we have to ascribe fully to Bayesian methods if you want uncertainty at a given test point. But what if we don't want to build a full-on Bayesian method? What if like, the method is given to us? We don't have flexibility to turn into a fully Bayesian method. And the point is you want to be able to build a wrapper on top of it in order to be able to do test time monitoring. So super simple idea here, um, sort of this notion of like, can we take advantage of the data distribution in your training data set in order to identify when you're unsure? And, and in this case, basically, um, so in recent years, Bing Kim wrote another paper that came out in 2018. And this actually, um, um, uh, actually some of these early ideas go back to McAllister back in 90s when he wrote. And Lyle Unger and McAllister, David McAllister, wrote papers on um, basically exploiting the local density principle somehow. And so here, so very intuitively, basically, you want to predict at a given test time. The question is, one, are there training data points around your test point? which would seem like an intuitive idea, but more. But here what we do is take advantage of not just the density, but also how does the model fit? So for instance, you may say you may have example, good examples around this particular test point, but maybe the specific model you're using is not very good at fitting the data around this test point. So it's not just taking into account how many data you have, but also like the, the, um, the quality of the model in fitting the data around you and then using that as a combination to be able to approximate um, uh, you know, the equivalent of like what looks like a trust score. So in Bean Kim's paper, she basically looks at the density, uh, but not they don't incorporate the model, but they look at the density to try to propose a test score. And here basically, essentially, um, this looks at both the density and the model. And you know, you can see, and we see that basically, um, if we can use a trust score like that at test time to identify points that we think are not reliable, you can now sort of have a human in the loop type system where those are the points where you might ship that off to an expert instead of letting uh, just the human uh, act with it independently. And, and we've implemented something like this in the context of you know, uh, health where we basically took all this data and we we're doing real time predictions of whether this person is at risk for an adverse event and you really don't want to um, you know, miss um, 
you, you don't want to miss, but at the same time, you don't want to be wrong. And if you're alerting all over the place, you're going to lead to a lot of false fatigue. And so using the trust score to be able to do something like if the trust score is very low, instead of alerting, let's wait and watch and collect a bit more data. And let's wait and watch and collect more data until you alert. Um, so with that, I'm going to, uh, since I have only two more minutes, I'm going to wrap up, uh, which says, I think sort of one of the bigger takeaways in sort of working in this space has been we love, I think it's so exciting and easy to gravitate towards very clean technical ideas. But the more I've sort of worked in these, uh, in sort of thinking through deployment, majority of these ideas have come from seeing examples where things fail and then trying to work backward to figure out what is a way by which we might you know, whether it's a simple or a complicated or a multi-step or a single step process by which we could start to guarantee, you know, reliability or monitor for reliability. And I think as uh, we start, and a lot of that requires deep, you know, really going in and have um, building a conceptual model of risk. So for instance, just this morning, you know, I saw people were like, hey, you know, we need really need methods that make it so that these machine learning things that we're deploying are like um, safe. And it would be really great if TensorFlow had a wrapper around it. And so the problem is we keep sort of gravitating towards totally automatic things where we don't have to put any thought into anything. And the challenge is, you know, I think by construction in this, like, the second in any other part of any other field of safety uh, monitoring or reliability engineering we've seen, basically, um, if you don't uh, understand where the risks are coming from, it's very hard to protect from it, which by construction means you really have to care about the thing you're building. Um, and um, so that's, and, and with that, I'll sort of summarize basically a need for mixed methods, the biggest key point get dirty, get in there, see what's failing, and then um, at a high level, what the, you know, we attempted to do was to try to think through off the examples people had spoken about, what's kind of a taxonomy for breaking up, what are the different kinds of failures, and then breaking up like where we need new work kind of into this idea of like learning techniques that give you failure prevention, um, reliability monitoring at test time, and then also maintenance. When do you know when the system's going stale so you'd have a way to observe and, um, and update? Um, and with that, I'll pause. Thank you. <laughs>